Well, today we're going to talk about the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. Now, these topics are encountered in many, many classes in engineering and physics related fields, so it's very possible you've seen these before. But I want to make sure that I cover it. And one reason is because of a story I can tell you many years ago when I was teaching classical mechanics, I skipped it because I thought that Chuck Bennett my colleague was going to teach it in optics. But then when I talked to Chuck Bennett after the courses were over, he says, no, I didn't do it. I thought you were going to do it in mechanics. And we want to avoid that. If we want to make an error, we want to do it twice because it's very, very important. And maybe three times because you might see it in a math class also. So here, we're going to do the Fourier series. The Fourier theorem is that any periodic wave can be uh, described by a series of cosines and sines where the uh, frequencies are f, 2f, 3f, 4f. In other words, uh, we call those the harmonics, or, or and usually they call them partials. So you can think of uh, as any sound, any periodic tone can be made by the partials, the harmonics. And you can take two approaches. You can say they're all going to be sine waves, where there's a phase involved. You have two degrees of freedom, the sine frequency and the phase. Or you can say cosines and sines and let the phases all be zero. And then you would have, for example, cosine nx with some kind of coefficient in front and then sine nx with coefficient and then all the phases are zero. And you can think of the Fourier transform as including cases in the cracks. In other words, when you like sing a pure tone and match it with the Fourier series, if you were to clap your hands or do some kind of other weird sound, like a drum sound, say for example, a complex sound like that, it's not periodic, doesn't have a tone, you would need an integral. You would have to have all the frequencies in between. Now I found that when I was at the University of Maryland studying this, it's hard to understand back in the old days, they didn't have visualizations like they do today. And I got a little bit lost in the math, but then when I was teaching or as an assistant, as an assistant teacher at the University of Maryland, a graduate student, Dr. Berg, who was teaching a physics and standard music class, he was explaining uh, the material with pictures. And I'm going to do that also to complement the mathematics. And many years ago, when I came to UN, well, I was at UNCA, uh, I had a student that was a physics major that did take my sound course first and saw and knew all the pictures. And when she was in an advanced mathematics class, in this math class, they were doing this, uh, she uh, had my notes and she could understand what they were doing. And another student there, a very smart young lady who became uh, our Valley Victorian or our Manly E. Wright Award uh, winner, she could see my former student or physics major that was in the class smiling looking at some notes that she didn't have. And she was frustrated, like we're all frustrated taking this Fourier series stuff. It's, it's uh, integrals and things. I was frustrated and so, but she saw my uh, physics major, uh, Debbie was, uh, you know, smiling and going along. So this other student raised her hand and the teacher says like, what's that? She says, I want what she's got. <laughs> Just like, I want what she's got, all right? Uh, I want what she's having over there. And he looked over, what's that? He saw all these pictures. And the professor came to my office the next day and says, can I have your notes? And I thought this was cool. Like, this is my notes. Like, what notes? What, like, for freshmen, like, physics and sound and music? Like, what's that? Like, this guy's teaching an advanced course in mathematics. So that was helpful. And that led me later to publish a program uh, that does the Fourier uh, series with sound. And we're going to take a, a, a little short segment to, uh, to show you that. So visualization plus the mathematics, best of both worlds. And we might want to point out one thing about mathematical rigor. When you do the Fourier series, you don't match a square wave perfectly because there's a little overshoot. Uh, Batman ears show up, but the area of that square will match the area of the series that you make. So it's not a point by point convergence but it is a perfect acoustic match because those rabbit ears or those Batman ears, when they shut close, it's like an infinite frequency. It's like, it's like there's no period. It's like you're not going to be able to hear that. And with the Fourier transform, likewise, I will do a physics kind of derivation. And these 
uh, would be looked at as in the spirit of physics uh, rather than a very rigorous mathematical proof. And that's the training that you get as a physicist doing derivations. That's the uh, practice of physics to do derivations in that fashion. So let's get along with the show. Before we start today, I'd like to show you something regarding Andrea Ghez, who won a Nobel Prize just a couple of weeks ago. And I wrote a paper on black holes where I used her data in, in a paper. And this, this work that I mentioned is a derivation that not many folks in the general population knew about. So I thought it would be nice to share it. So I look at a calculation here that goes back a couple hundred years or so, I think late 1700s actually. And it's a classical derivation of escape velocity where you have a velocity you're gonna to give to a, a mass and there is no atmosphere neglected and you want this to escape the gravitational field of the Earth or the Sun or this body and at infinity come to rest, basically. So you have the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, plus the potential energy, which in the case of gravitational field is given by this in general. Here we're gonna have, this R is gonna be capital R, that's where we're starting. And at infinity we'll have no kinetic energy and we'll have no potential energy. So the potential energy is minus G M M over R. So now we, put the speed of light in for C, because see if you, you can't, if light can't escape, it's to be a black hole. Now, this is classical. This is not the relativistic formula for kinetic energy. This is not the relativistic formula to handle gravity, potential energy, but these two mistakes cancel. You get one half, M, this MC squared is GM M over R. These M's go out. And you get R, if you bring R on this side, is 2 GM over C squared. And this is the Schwarzschild radius that you get from general relativity. So I used some data of Andrea Ghez and talked about the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And have fond memories of a talk given at the University of Rome by Charles Misner back around the early 70s when I was an undergraduate talking about the possible black hole in the center of the galaxy. And Andrea Ghez did work. And if we uh, look at this, uh, this, this mass is this black, black hole, uh, you find uh, something like four times 10 to the six solar masses. But this radius is nice, Schwarzschild radius. That means if you could get all the mass of the sun into like, you know, radius of like, something like, you know, something like three kilometers or so, then you get the black hole in general relativity. And if you get the mass of the Earth down to like a centimeter or so, uh, you would then get a black hole. So, uh, congratulations to the Nobel Prize winners. Here they are, the three of them. That did work and black hole physics. Chapter R. Fourier. Section R1. Fourier series. Here's Fourier, and this is remarkable, the Fourier series idea 
that we're going to show a periodic wave can be expressed in terms of component parts, which in sound are called the partials, or we can refer to them as the harmonics. So we're going to look at this idea. A function can be expressed in terms of, here I'm gonna put a constant term, and I'm gonna divide by two, and you'll see why that's uh, convenient in a second. And this would be a sum from M as an integer, say, well, one, two, three, four, five. M stands for those positive integers. So M is going to go from one to infinity. And we're going to look at cosines and sines. You could, if you wanted to, use the signs where you added a phase factor. So you could do this. This is an alternative approach. You know, M, X, plus some phase for M. But I'm gonna use the more traditional uh, method to just break that up into sines and cosines. And here, you remember that when the sine, you have the sine of x, you have a sine function, and if you have, remember this number is kind of your wave number, so if you have 2x, then there's two of the sines fitted in that interval, and 3 and 4, and that's what we know as harmonics. When we have time instead of x, it would be like double the frequency, triple the frequency, etc. So I want to show you what the A naught is and the AM and the BM. That's what we're going to do. We're going to derive the formulas for the Fourier series. Now you can think of the Fourier theorem is that any periodic wave can be expressed in this fashion in terms of sines and cosines. A periodic wave is a function that just repeats every uh, cycle. So we're going to take the cycle to be from minus uh, pi to, to pi. And we're going to be able to fit all of our periodic waves in that interval, with that, with that interval cycle. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna consider integrating from minus pi to plus pi. And if you've seen this in other course, that's okay. This is important enough to be covered more than once, and it gives you a break uh, from, from some material to, to do review. So if we do this integral, you have three things to integrate. So the first thing would be to integrate a naught over two, and that would be dx. Remember, minus pi to pi, we got everything set up so that that's one cycle. And here, when we do the, the sum from one to infinity, we're going to look at here, the first integral, minus pi to plus pi, a m cosine of m x and the x and then the integral for the sine, and that's the B coefficients. You can think of this like sculpture, that you have this series of sines and cosines, and then you, you chip away and form the A's so that it matches the function. That's what we're going to be doing. MX, DX. And now I would like to show you that these two are gonna be zero, and we're just gonna have the one. Since that's a constant, the AM, what I'm gonna do is show you that if I go from minus pi to plus pi, cosine of MX dx is equal to zero. 
probably the easiest way to look at that is to think area. That when you have a full cycle of a cosine, you have the same amount of positive area and negative area if you go over a cycle. So here's minus pi to pi. So your, your, your cosine is up here and it comes down like that and it goes like the negative one. So it does this. But if you look at that, like this area down here matches this area and this area matches that area, but one's positive and one's negative. And the same thing with the sine here. If we look at the sine function, we would have something that goes like this. And that's from minus pi to plus pi. This is a positive area, that's negative area. And then when m is two, three, or four, you just have two of them in that interval. Okay, so then we go to look at this first, this first one. This is very easy because the uh, a over t, a naught over two comes out, and you're just integrating from minus pi to pi dx, and that's going to be here and x minus pi to pi, and that's going to be here pi minus a negative pi. And that's going to be uh, a naught over two, two pi. There's a pi here. So that's why I picked the two, so I could have the nice formula for the a naught as one over pi, and then the integral from minus pi to pi f of x uh, dx. Uh, this will become more obvious in a second, because when I do the other ones, you're gonna see these pi's popping up like this a lot, and this makes all the equations look similar. Okay, so then, the second thing to consider is to consider, and this is the secret, see they hit the f of x here with the cosine, say of nx, where n is gonna be, one, two, three, four, five, six. But I pick it to be different than the M because we want to be careful whenever you have a sum and you're summing over this variable, you don't want to pick that M again because that's already defined in that sum. So if we if we then if we then do that, we're gonna find that this is gonna consist of two integrals. The first integral is gonna be zero because that's gonna be a constant times the cosine of nx, which we already showed that cosine of any you know, positive integer you know, times the x, we already did that case, is zero. And there may be more cases, I'm, we, there could be negative integers, but here we're just considering positive integers for this problem, so we're covered, we're good. That's gonna, that's gonna be the two integrals in the summation. So you have m goes from one to infinity. We're going to integrate here a n, and this is gonna be cosine of n, n x, this is a m by the way, a m, cosine n x, cosine of m x dx, plus one for the sine. So let's make sure we got this correct. The AM here goes with the cosine MX from up here. And then the cosine of NX is coming from the multiplication, the setup of this integral. And the neat thing about this is that this projects out just the uh, cosine case when the N equals M. That's what I'm gonna show you. And then the second one here, when it's cosine and sine is gonna be zero. See if I can show you that. Now remember, the uh, Euler formulas are very, very important that relate sines and cosines. So we want to write these down again. We're going to use these. All right, cosine and sines in terms of the Euler, the Euler relation. Remember the Euler relations, the I, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. And you get these very easily by putting in a minus sine and the sine has a minus. Then you should add the sines cancel divided by two. So that's 
very important stuff there. And if we look at the case where n is not equal to m, all right, so where these, these are different, that's the one I want to show you, but then you're going to get minus pi to plus pi, you're going to have the, the two cosine terms. First one is going to be with the n, and then there's going to be one with the m. Second one has the m. over the two. Now the main thing here is when you multiply these out, you'll get four terms. This will be an n plus m term in the exponent. This will be an n with a minus m. This is a minus n because when you do your exp exponentials, uh, those, those exponents add, you know, a plus b. So here the main thing is if n doesn't equal m, then you're gonna have here four terms, but they're gonna be of this type, minus pi to pi e to the i px, where this p is never gonna be equal to zero. All right, so the p, because uh, the only way to get zero would be you have n, see, then minus m, and the n was equal to m, then we get zero. But see, in the case where it's not equal, they're not equal, this will never be zero. So this will be integrated very easily, ipx over ip, and you go from minus pi to pi, and that's going to be 1 over i pi. And this is going to be cosine of px plus i sine of px, like that. If you want, you can put parentheses around here just to make sure it's clear. And this is going to be minus pi to plus pi. But here, you're going to find that you're going to get zero because the cosine p is going to be some integer and it's, it's, it's except it can't be zero. And, and it might be negative because, you know, there's negative signs here. So I don't really care what that is because, see, if I have here, this is zero and the pi is over here. If, as long as p is not zero, then I'm going to have, like, so here's p is one, I go here. If p is 2, I'm back to here. If p is 3, you know, 4, so I'm going to be in one of these places. But p is committed, it's going to be one or the other. So if it's here, then when I do cosine of, uh, you know, plus and minus, in other words, when I put the when I put the plus and the minus in, I'm going to go to the same place because, see, if p is, say, 4, I would go here, one, two, three, four, I would be there. But if I went negative with the negative, I go one, two, three, four, I'm still there. If P is three, I go one, two, three, it's three pi. If P is, if I put in the X is negative, I go the other way, one, two, three, I'm still there, it gets zero. And the same thing here, this is zero. So far, we have shown that if n does not equal to m, this integral will be zero. Now, this integral will always be zero because this is an even function, cosine. This is an odd function. And when you integrate over a symmetric region, like from minus pi to plus pi, you'll have an odd function here because even times odd is going to be odd. And an odd function over a symmetric interval like this is going to give you zero. But then what about the case where n equals m? Well, m equals n equals m, you'd have then these two cases, minus pi to plus pi, you'd have the cosine squared of nx dx. And then for the other term, you would have here cosine nx times the sine of nx. Because you remember we have two terms here. The other term here would be the cosine of nx with the sine of mx, you know, coming from this, this other term. So here, if these are the same, you would then get this.
but this has to be zero because this is an odd function and this is an even function and we're integrating over a symmetric in 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 interval. So if you're going over an interval where like one function here is say odd, in other words, it's negative on this side, positive there, and the other function is gonna be like positive, you know, symmetrical like this, something, it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's symmetrical, then when this area multiplies that when you get positive, and when this one it multiplies that when you get negative. So whenever you have an even function and odd function over like a symmetric interval, this is zero. So that just leaves me with this one. And we did a trick with this one before. We said that if you ever integrate over like a full cycle or some multiple cycles, then the cosine and the sine are gonna have same areas. So we're gonna have this plus this. And since that's equal to one, then when you do this integral, it'll be like the integral we did before. Uh, you're basically going to have here integration to be x from minus pi to pi, and that'll be pi minus a minus pi, which is two pi, and see that that here one half is going to cancel, and I'm going to get this nice pi result. So that means this whole integral is going to pull out is going to pull out the one where n equals m, which is this one. It's the only one that's going to survive, and it's going to be a pi in front of it, a pi in front of it. So therefore, this integral is going to be a n times pi. Very simple. And if you do the same thing by multiplying this with the sine of nx, the same logic is going to apply, and you're going to pull out the b n. So now we have we have the formulas. So case three would be minus pi to pi of f of x sine of nx dx. And when you do that, you would get the similar result that you're going to pull off the one with the b, so the b one. So let's go ahead and write down uh, the three equations uh, from this one here. We get a naught. We already have this one. Okay, one over pi minus pi to pi. Okay, this one, this one's already been derived. And then now we have the other ones. A n is one over pi minus pi to pi f of x cosine of n x. And then the b n is one over pi minus pi to pi f of x sine of nx dx. And these are the equations. So this is the master equation to set up with. And then these three equations show you how to get the a's and, and the coefficients, the a's and the b's. Now this, this cool result that we found, we could write this way to show you some fancy notation. Uh, this is the here nice little symbol, the chronic Kronecker uh, delta symbol that if i equals j, the delta ij is zero, and if i equals j, the delta ij is one. And this is in the book. I just want to show you this notation. So we show that when you do this integral, if n doesn't equal m, you get zero, and if n equals m, you get pi. And this is a cool way of like summarizing that. So you've probably seen that notation in other courses, or if you haven't, you will. I mean that's that's used kind of quite commonly. So. That's uh, neat to see that. Let's do an example, and the classic example to do is the square wave. So you go here from minus pi to plus pi, and here, say, we have negative 1, and then we go up here, and we have a positive 1. And this, you know, it's periodic waves. This goes on. This goes on and on like this.
So since this is an odd function, that means we're not gonna have the even case. This is gonna be zero, and this is an even function because it's the same on either side, a constant. So we're only gonna have the odd ones, and we need to put in here B, M. So this is basically recopying the formula we had earlier. So in this case, we're going to then do this last formula. This is one over pi from minus pi to plus pi. And here, Here we could, we could break this up into two integrals, minus uh, pi to zero, where the functions is minus one. And then we can add to that one over pi and then go from zero to pi with the plus one, sine of nx dx. But what I like to do is you know, since this function is odd, and this function is odd, that means the result on the first half of the cycle will turn out to be equal to the result here. Because when you have two odds, you'll get an even. So you could replace this with the two in front and go from zero to pi and just have the one, the function is one, say, and then the sine of nx dx. So in other words, on the right-hand side, we have a one, we're gonna go from zero to pi, and by doubling it, we'll get the result on this side where we had a negative sign, but a negative one. So a negative one times a negative sign is gonna be a plus, so you get the same result. So this kind of saves some time than like doing all that. So this would get you 2 over pi, and this would be minus the cosine of nx over n from 0 to pi. We can check this. If you take the derivative of the cosine, you get negative the sine, and with the chain rule, you'll pop out that n, so that would cancel, so this, this works. And then when you uh, plug in, you're going to have, say, to be a minus sign out here, so keep the minus sign out there, we'll have a a cosine of pi, uh, or n times pi, let's put the n first, n times pi, and this is all over n, minus the cosine of uh, zero. So this is gonna be a one, and for the cosine of n pi. Now, if you look at this, let's take two cases. Say you have the even case, you know, where n is some two times k, where k is, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and this in two, four, uh, six, eight, these are your even numbers. Then when you have an even uh, number, you got times pi, uh, here is like zero, here is pi, so if you have an even number, you'll be back to here. One, there's two pi. There's four pi, there's six pi. So you're, you're the same. So like you're gone, like it's like one minus one. So these are gonna be zero. So then we're gonna try the odds. So the odd would be if you take a two K minus one, that just shows you how you can do a, a parameterization of the odd numbers. So K here equals one, two, three you get then odd numbers, two times k minus one, say two times one minus one is one, two times two is four minus one is three. So if you do that, then when you set this up with the zero and the pi, you'll have an odd one, two, three, you'll be here. See, one, two, three, four, five, you'll be here. So, so here, if n is odd, you're gonna be here. And that's going to get you a cosine of something that's going to be a negative one. So for the odd cases, you're going to have a negative one minus one over n. 
And now you see this, all these minus signs are gonna cancel, but let's keep that minus sign for now. This is minus two over n. So this is a plus four over pi n. So in other words, bn is gonna be four over n, or let's say four over pi, let's do it that way so we can have the n second, I like this better. And then just remind us that this is for odd n. So that's the answer, we're done. Let's write it out. So the f of x, the function, is four over pi, and then you're gonna have here sine of x plus the third case, sine of three x plus one over five, see these odd numbers, five x, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down, down the road. Now, when I first studied this, I didn't really understand like it very well until I was working at the University of Maryland with the professor Dr. Berg, who was teaching like general students the same thing. And he came up, or, or someone did, but I learned it from him, I learned this trick, that if you're trying to make a square wave like this, you would try the sine wave of the same, with the same frequency. That's like, this is, this is like your sine of x. And, you know, I joke with my students, say among friends, is that pretty close? Say, well, I got a, I got a crest here and a trough there. Say, no, that's not good, you're messing up. See, this has to come up, this has to come down, this has to come up, this has to come down, this has to come up, and this has to come down. But what does that? Well, actually, you're doing wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You're doing triple the frequency. So here, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle does it, and now, I can't prove to my students that are general students that it's one third. You know, you have this here in this proof, and we did the one third, but I can say it kind of like a third of a cup. I do a baking analogy. It's like a, a full cup of the first harmonic and a third of the cup there. And when you add those together, you get this. So that looks a little bit better. But now to fix this one, what you would do is you would have to come up, down, up, down, up, down, and then here uh, you would come up from that one down there, up there, and down there to help correct things. So you're really focusing on this top one. Up, down, up, down, up, and then down, up, down, up, down. And this is wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. That's three of them. Wiggle, wiggle, that's five five total, so here they are, wiggle, see, uh, in sync here. And when you do that, you then, you get a better approximation. And by keep doing that, you get uh, the ironing out of the wrinkles. You iron out the wrinkles, and then you get these rabbit ears, which are very complicated. It's a really an advanced uh, topic, but you get the Gibbs phenomenon, or the Wilbraham Gibbs phenomenon, since Wilbraham had discovered also, we didn't know that at the time. It was Michelson who was making one of these, synthesizing the waves you know, with oscillators and found this phenomenon and went to Gibbs at Yale, mathematician. He said, no, it's, it's really there. It's not, it's, not, it's not you. So then the question is, mathematically speaking, is this a perfect match? If when you do all this, you basically have a little rabbit ear you know, like this, for Batman ears. You have Batman ears like that. And the answer is, it's not a point by point convergence as mathematicians would like to have perfection. But since the area is gonna be perfect, it's, a, it's an acoustic match, we would say, if you're doing sound, it's a perfect acoustic match. So not a problem, but not a point by point convergence. This is something like around 18% overshoot. Very fascinating. Now to get some engineering in here, uh, let's look at a, a square wave on an oscilloscope. And we often refer to this as just a time domain because the uh, axis here are milliseconds. And here the way you would 
worked the oscilloscope, you would say, well, look at this. This has uh, one cycle here is two milliseconds. Say, so if you went like here and like there, it's like two milliseconds. When these are not lined up like that, we, we just count like all of them because this is 16 milliseconds and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you would divide and get the period as two milliseconds. Then if you do the, if you do the uh, Fourier series on that, so here's where now we're doing time. So like we were doing like sine of X, but now if we were doing like sine, let's say we were had like a, an omega T as the, uh, so yeah, if you were doing, you had sine of X, that's sine of three X, and sine of four X, but you can think of that there is, you know, the, the third one is triple the frequency and the fifth one's five times the frequency. Or you can just change the variable to like T and have omega T, you know, if you'd like. When you apply it to physics, as we did this one as pure mathematics, the X's had like no dimensions. So here, let's look at the uh, engineering thing. So that's uh, two milliseconds. And then if you do the Fourier series, you get you see the uh, frequency here, by the way, you gotta find the frequency first. Frequency is one over T. But when you have T in milliseconds, a cool formula I uh, tell my intro students to do, because we do labs like this in the intro physics of Santa Music class, then you would get here 500 Hertz. And that would be equal to a half a kilohertz. So then for your Fourier series, a half a kilohertz, one full cup, then second harmonic, none, triple, one third of a cup, and then nothing, and then the fifth, one fifth of a cup, nothing, and one seventh of a cup, which is 0.14, 14 cents on the dollar, if you do one seventh of a dollar, and then one ninth, when it's not shown, would be uh, 11 cents, like 0.11. So that's your kilohertz, and this is called the frequency domain. So you're looking at in the frequency space, like if there's time is like a space, time space, time domain, you see the oscilloscope. If you look at the frequency domain, you see the Fourier series. And this is the recipe, see that nice? Like put it on an index card. So very nice application to engineering. Now take a break to do the uh, the applet that I, I published. So we do that next. Okay, we're, we're going to look at this uh, application which I developed and published. It's a 16 harmonic Fourier series web app with sound. And there'll be a link at our site for you to go check this out. Here is the program. And we have 16 harmonics and let's make a square wave. Well, you can, you can do it manually. It's one third the height, 33 cents on the dollar. And it might be easier just to come up here and punch in the 33. Can you hear the other harmonic come in? And then the fifth harmonic is going to be 0 0.2, 20 cents on the dollar. Oops. It. Here we go. And then 14 cents on the dollar. So you can see the formation of the waves we talked about in class. All right, here's 14. And then one ninth of a dollar is like 11 cents, one ninth of 99 cents. And here I have it so that you can hear all those the harmonics. We usually don't pick out harmonics easily unless you're a piano tuner or a musician. But you can now practice, watch, watch me take a harmonic out. You hear that come and go? Here's triangle. Boy, that's, that's amazing how the triangle can be made very, very easily. Notice the triangle has phases. I, I have this set up so it's all sine waves with phases. So you don't have to worry about cosines. But the phases take the place. Triangle. See, that's a richer sound, has more partials. Uh, these are called overtones. This is the 
fundamental. These are overtones, or all of them are called partials or harmonics. can here also change the bass frequency. Isn't that nice? A Fourier synthesizer. Here's another cool application, a program I developed for my general students and, and also students of physics majors now can use this. This shows the next harmonic in correcting for the to make the square wave, and here, since the next harmonic's even, we don't use it, it doesn't show uh, anything, and then here is the next harmonic I had added, and this is what we did visually for you in the class, but what this does, and I made this so go to 99 or so, and you can see that the wrinkles get ironed out, and you can see the Wilbraham Gibbs phenomenon, the Batman ears, starting to show, with from the point of view of rigorous mathematics, it's not a point by point convergence due to that overshoot. It's about you know twenty percent overshoot. You can actually see that here. One, two, three, four blocks going up, and this looks like uh, here. Uh, this is like point seven out of four. So if you uh, divide that, work that out, you get something like eighteen uh, percent overshoot. that nice and you could you could like you know just do this okay so here's a rant wave okay. pulse train is cool that's basically all the frequencies uh, and the harmonics added up one one at a time I mean you basically had the same amplitudes for all those okay. you can change the frequency for all these nice so you have some fun with that. The sine wave just is done. There's just one, just the sine wave. Okay. R3 is next. And that's the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is, you can think of it like taking the uh, periodic wave and you have a series, but if you had like, say a drum or some kind of complicated sound, like just like that, then you have, you wouldn't have a periodic wave. You'd have more complicated case. And that's when you're going to need all the things in between, like all the frequencies, like, like the others. And that's going to be an integral. So you might recall earlier that we looked at a wave and considered some integral of the basic waves, the i, you know, kx minus omega t, like this, is integrate over this. So this, this is similar to the Fourier series now, but we're doing a continuous, because see, this is sines and cosines in here, so instead of having a sum, you're doing an integral. So let's uh, see how we can approach this. So the first thing, the first thing to do is to look at the part where we had the series. All right, so let's go ahead and put the series part in. M goes from one to infinity. This is a M, but instead of putting the cosine, let's put E to the I M X plus E to the minus I M X over two. In fact, we can do this. And then here plus B M to E to the I M X minus E to the minus I M X. And that's over a two I. Okay, and that's gonna be, there we go. Okay, so now that I in the denominator bothers me, so let's do this. Let's uh, multiply top and bottom by I, which will get us a negative sign down here, so we have to flip the order of these things. E to the minus I MX is first. 
and then minus i e to the plus i m x by multiplying top and bottom by i. We flip the order. So this is what we had before. This is the cosine of m x, and this here is the sine of m x. All right. So we're switching to the exponential notation. And then what we can do is write our f of x again, where we have this summation from one to infinity, we're gonna collect the terms that have a similar e, so I'm gonna leave a space here to put something, e to the i mx and plus, and I have to give a space there, e to the minus i m x. Since I have a plus i m x in either case and a minus, I can then factor those out. So this one with the plus would have the a m, but over here it's going to have a, a negative i with the b m. So this is going to be AM minus IBM, and there's a two. So AM, you know, one half, there's the AM, and there's the one half that takes care of this one. And then over here I have the BM, but I have a minus I over two. And then over in this case, what we're gonna have is well, for the minus i m x, we still have an a m, so that's gonna be the same. But now we have a plus sign. So this will be a plus i b m, and we divide by two. And it's nice that the i's are upstairs. So now, when we get this far, we can say that this is kind of, here, look at this. We can go f of x, we can have here, and go from negative infinity to plus infinity and some constant c of n, constants i and x. Now see, this is very nice because here, since when m was positive, I'm gonna have a plus case and a negative case. If the m is promoted to, let's say, an n, which can now go from negative infinity to plus infinity, then I pick up both of these and whatever the C's have to be to make it work. And this actually works for the first term. Watch this, because if N is equal to zero, you then get here, you get C zero times one. So in other words, the C zero is the A zero over two. Now we have to be careful if n is greater than zero, then we're gonna get here for the c, we're gonna get the a n minus the i b n over two. That's this case. And if the n is less than zero, see, we'll be then picking up this case, which is the a n plus i b n over two, so you have to be careful here, but this is compact notation. So when n is positive, everything is the same as would be on this side. But if n is negative, then here, I'm gonna get these coefficients. So because when n is negative, uh, this m is always positive, so I'll have the minus m case. So that's very, very nice. So once when we get that far, we can say that, remember before, the a naught is one over pi minus pi to plus pi f of x dx. And that's gonna become here, we have the c o is c's one half of what the a was. So that means this will be one half, one over two pi minus pi to plus pi f of x uh, dx. Now what about the other coefficients, what happens to a n? We'll see a n 
here we're generalizing to get to the C. So this is going to be minus pi to plus pi. Remember, we had f of x cosine of nx dx. And then we had for the bn, we had 1 over pi minus pi to plus pi f of x sine of nx dx. So these are equations from before. So now we want to couple these together and see uh, how the CNs are going to work. Well, we have the two cases. If n is greater than zero, then we're going to have the minus case. So we're going to have here for CN, we're going to have 1 over 2 pi minus pi to pi f of x. We're going to have the cosine of nx. And since the, the B and has the minus sign, we just take, take this with the minus I sine of NX DX. So what we did here is we looked at what the CN is this thing when N is greater than zero. So that's the AN, but the AN is whatever this is. So we just put it in there, uh, the two, uh, it's a two, it's, it's a n over two, so when we took this thing and divide it by two, that's where that two came from, and there we got that, cosine, and then minus, there's the minus i, the two is still out here, and the pi, you know, is there, and then you have the sine. Say so everything works out fine, that's nice. And that would give us, say if you look at this thing, that's e to the minus i n x. But then if n is less than zero, then the c n would be, and yeah, we're doing a similar thing here. For less than zero, we have this thing, a n, the same as before, so that's the cosine of n x. And here we have a plus sign, plus i sine of nx dx. So looking at a n plus i b n. Well, here is a n. So we have it here. The, the pi is there. That 2, you know, you have to have that 2 because you're dividing. And then here it's plus. So there's plus the other one. Say you plus with the i. i in front one half, there's the one half, and then that pi there is there. So then you have this case is e to the plus i n x. But then you said, well, wait a minute here. I could combine these together. Watch this trick. If c n is one over two pi, and I go from minus pi to plus pi, f x, and I take e, let's take this one with the plus sign, e to the minus i n x, like this, dx. When n goes negative, I got this one. See, when n is less than zero, you have to have the minus sign. So when I have, when n is less than zero, this is gonna be a plus sign. So like if n is negative two, so if n is negative two, then minus, minus two is gonna be plus two, it's this one. If n is positive, like if n is two, then I have minus two in there. Well, that's what this is. So this equation gets us both, and just check, what about the case where it's zero? Well, if it's zero, I just have the integral of fx. I got it, it's, it's, it's the zero one works, they all work. So that's that's this is the this is moving now toward the uh, Fourier transform, and for notational purposes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be changing the variable in a second. So I'm going to rewrite this, where I go from minus pi to plus pi. I'm going to put here f of z, e to the minus i n z, d z, and then the equation we started with. Here, if we go the other way, this is n is minus infinity to plus infinity, cn e to the i n z. Now, 
let's just remind ourselves that that's very important. That came from here. So I'm taking the X, making it Z, and taking the X and making it Z. So then I have the equations that go both ways. So this is the F of Z in terms of something go over here, the constants, and then the constant in terms of the F of Z. Okay, so these are the equations we have so far. And what I would like to do next is I'd like to change the variable, the z variable, which is going from minus pi to plus pi. I'd like to now go to an x that goes from minus l to plus l. So then z over x is proportional to the pi over l. So let's think of x as the big one. It goes from minus L to plus L, and Z is a small one. So if Z equal pi, then X has to equal L. And this gives me the proportionality so that if, you can just check it, if X is zero, Z is zero. If X is L, Z is pi. If X is negative L, Z is negative pi. So just think of, you know, from the center, if you go up to Z, and from the center you go up to X, they have to be in that ratio, pi to L. So once we have that, we can then do a DZ is equal to pi over L DX, and then a DX is L over pi DZ. And we can now go about to do our change of variables. So if we do that, well, let's do that first with this one. And I'll go ahead and call this some G function just for now, since I'm gonna replace the Z with pi over L times X, all right? And that's gonna be equal to the summation here from N go from minus infinity to plus infinity, CN, and this is gonna be a replace here for the Z. I'm gonna replace here pi over L times X. All right, then the CN one here would be one over two pi. And now we're gonna do the change of variables. So now we're gonna go from minus L to plus L, and this will be then the G function of pi over LX. And this is E to minus I N. And then we just put in the pi over LX same with the minus sign, like I say, same thing with the minus sign. And then for the uh, DZ, what's the DZ? Well, it's this thing here. It's pi over L DX. Now we're gonna get some cancellations. Pi is gonna cancel here, and you're gonna get uh, here, the CN is gonna have the one over two L. Let's go ahead and now come back making this an f of x, all right? And this is negative infinity to plus infinity. And this is then cn. And this is gonna be, here, nice definition. k is gonna be equal to n pi over l. That means I'm gonna have here I times KX, because N pi over L is gonna be K. That looks kinda nice, all right? And the E. So what we have done here is we have let the C N alone, and we have taken the E and replaced the N pi over L with the K.
to get this form. And that's a very nice compact form that you're looking at there. Let's write down the corresponding CN. Go ahead and clean this up a little bit. This is 1 over 2L since the uh, pi's canceled. And we're going to integrate from minus L to plus L. And that's going to be, say, F of X, because we're putting the G back to F here, E to the minus I K X. And that's going to be a DX. Now we're almost there with the Fourier transform. We would like this one though to be an integral. And there's a neat way to, to make this an integral. What you do is you multiply by delta n because delta n is one. Every time you go n to the next one, a delta n, it's gonna be one. And then you use this trick here that n is k l over pi. So that delta n here is delta k times l over pi. So if I do that, all right, let's go ahead and write this again. f of x is equal to summation here and goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And I'm gonna have an l times a cn and over pi. And then we're gonna have e to the i k x delta k. All right, that's what we're gonna get from this, this one here. Because the l over pi and the cn is there. Everything looks good. Then this lower one, uh, cn, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put the l over on the left there, is one over l minus l to plus l, f of x, e to the minus i k x dx. Okay, so the l went over the other side, so what I have here is a two. All right, the l went over to the left. Okay, now, to get this one to be an integral, I'm gonna look at this together and promote n to a continuous variable. N's gonna be a continuous variable. So we're gonna look at this as being some c function of k, and this is gonna become dk, and then I'm gonna integrate over the k, because the n is being promoted. So we're gonna take the, we're gonna rip off the n, make it a continuous function. We're gonna take the delta x, make it a dx, and turn the summation sign into a snake. So if we do that, there are the three steps. There's the snake, minus infinity to plus infinity, and this is gonna be c a k. There's a one over pi floating around, e to the i k x d k. There you have it. Uh, perhaps you could have, uh, you know, kept the delta n here if you wanted. It may have been cleaner to see the n, the delta n, and some constants floating around, and then uh, go continuous and make the change a variable. Um, you could have said this is some c of n, make the n continuous, but uh, I, this is this is where we want it. We want to be, so we're, we're good. Okay, so then uh, what we do now is we look at this and see that really is the C of K to be consistent with our, with our notation, all right? Because we got the N has now been replaced by that continuous variable. So now we have these two equations where the C of K is one over two. And we're gonna let the L go to infinity and mathematicians are gonna be a little nervous about that because you know, if this goes to infinity, this better go to zero to have some kind of consistent definition. And we're not gonna worry about it. And this is the tradition of physics to do things sloppy and let the mathematicians clean up after us and make their publications. So like with the Fourier series, the Gibbs phenomenon, for example, the Wilbraham Gibbs phenomena, that's not a point by point convergence, you know, with the Batman ears, and we have this. And mathematicians kind of fixed that up for us and uh, they worked on that, the Wilbraham and Gibbs, independently of each other.
So once we have the, these two, you have your equations, but then now authors kind of differ on the uh, nice way to, to give the final form. What I like to do, since there's a pi there and a two there, I like to use the notation. Not all, not all authors do this. I like to then split the difference and have one at a square root and put two, the two and the pi together with a square root sign. And this is then minus infinity to plus infinity. And then we'll make that C a K, a capital F of K, e to the I K X D K, all right? And then the other one here, uh, this one here is gonna be then the capital F of K. We'll have a one over square root of two pi also minus infinity to plus infinity f of x, and now they have the e to the minus ikx, like this. So there we go. Uh, this is the function, f of x, and this one here is the Fourier transform, something, sometimes, sometimes written as this, the Fourier transform. And since we're getting the function back, this is sometimes called the inverse Fourier transform on the FK function to get back the original one. And guess what? Remember at the beginning of this class, we said A of K, E to the I K X, D K with some superposition of waves, like a wave packet of some sort. Well, look at that. There you have it, there you have it there. And A of K, F of K. So it relates to the waves that we've been doing. Let's do one example and we'll end this class. R4 transform example and we're going to do the rectangular pulse. A rectangular pulse simply a rectangle, height one, that goes from minus a over two to plus a over two. So to take the Fourier transform, to get the capital F of k, it's one over the square root of two pi. And here you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. However, since this function is zero most places, if you go beyond the rectangle, you have zero. This becomes an integral from minus a over two to plus a over two. And since the function is one there, we're just gonna integrate this exponential, which integrates to e to minus i k x over a minus i k. And we go put the limits in. So therefore, we'll have one over square root of two pi, and there'll be one over a negative i k, and this is gonna be e to the minus i k a over two, minus e to the plus i k a over two, we put in the limits, and I'm going to let the minus sign swap the order here. So I K A over two minus E to the minus I K A over two. And then here, if we bring the I in here, we're gonna see a sign is showing up. So I'm going to bring the I in there. And I'm going to put a two there, put a two here. So this part gets me the sine of Ka over two. And if we look at this here and put sine Ka over two, and here I have a Ka over two, 
I have my K over two flip. I need to put an A here to make this work. So the A's cancel. And then here the K over two flips over to get two over K. And this is the Fourier transform. And this is the sink. This is the sink of K A over two. All right. So that's the transform. And here we have the sink. The sink is an interesting function. The sign is odd and X is odd. So when you divide like this, you get something that is symmetric. So the blue is the cosine, and then the red here is the sink. And remember that the sink at zero is one. And the X makes the ripples die down as X gets bigger on either side. So that's nice. So we're looking at here rectangular pulse in regular X, X space, X and F of X. This is what the Fourier transform space looks like, that red, that sink uh, formula. And that's similar to over here when we looked at the time domain and then went to the frequency domain. So this is again, similar idea. I wanted to mention one last thing, this cool diagram and derivation of that famous formula called the Lormor formula. This was due to J.J. Thompson, discoverer of the electron. And if you go back nine generations in your teaching line and J.J. Thompson's teacher was Lord Rayleigh.